Well, we'll take a break now. I know why I was making the mix up with ICPC and uh, uh, Pebec. It's actually Pebec at five. Um, and yes, there was also that second national summit of ICPC. But we will be speaking uh, with someone from Pebec, someone very important from Pebec. And there will be a lot to talk about, just in case you're wondering what that's about. Pebec is the Presidential Enabling Business uh, Environment Council. Um, and of course, you'll be seeing just who we'll be speaking to in just a moment. Please stay with us. It's been five years since President Muhammadu Buhari established the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, headed by the Vice President, Professor Yemio Shimbajo. An intergovernmental and interministerial council tasked with removing bureaucratic constraints to doing business in Nigeria. Investors are unlikely to invest their scarce resources where the cost of production is high and where it's not competitive enough. We therefore seize this momentous milestone to renew the com commitment of the PEBEC through its secretariat to deepen these reforms for more tangible impact in the lives of our fellow citizens and investors. But one day, this event showcased a musical detailing some of the achievements of the council in tackling challenges faced by small businesses, including arduous company registration processes, multiple taxation, among other issues previously faced by businesses in Nigeria. The council is highlighting these gains a few weeks after RMD, a division of First Rand Bank Limited, reported that Nigeria dropped from Africa's top 10 investment destinations to 14th position. The ranking is based on countries' business operating environments. The council is unveiling its five-year impact assessment report, which according to the vice president, who is also the chair of the council, has its strengths and weaknesses. Nigeria has moved, as we've heard, an aggregate of 39 places on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index since 2019. And we were twice, and were twice named as one of the top most uh, improved economies in the world in the last three cycles. Most of the problems come from systemic constraints or agencies and officials sometimes who fail or resist change. So we must, in the coming months, work with the agencies to implement a more aggressive accountability audit. And uh, the, the report that we've just launched is really the first, the, 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 the first step in that, in that direction. The Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council has its work cut out for it, tackling bureaucratic bottlenecks and widespread corruption at all levels. However, the team seems poised to take on this challenge head on and ensure Nigeria becomes a progressively easier place to start and grow a business. Thanks for staying with us. Doing business in Nigeria has been a concern for a very, very long time. And so when you look at the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index from time to time, you just wonder, where are we? And uh, government has taken that on with the setting up of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, PEBEC, in 2016. Five years on, how far so far? Let's have a conversation on that, have an assessment, uh, sort of speak with Dr. Jimoke Oduwale, who is secretary to the council, as well as special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. She joins us virtually. Thanks for joining us this morning, madam. Morning. Is it safe for me to say your job has been an easy one since you are about easy business? <laughs> No, <laughs> it's not. So, well, maybe the first thing would be to set ease of doing business parameters for you so that you can give us ease of doing business. <laughs> well, 
the council is trying, they're trying, at least the political support has been there consistently for five years. Well, in the past five years, I mean, most certainly the, the major challenge many people have talked about is what they call bureaucratic bottlenecks with micro, uh, well, with ministries, departments, and agencies. And the vice president said as much, uh, you know, in over time, he has uh, spoken about that consistently. How, taking that on must be quite an odd task, especially given that the vice president himself said there's been some resistance to change. How long is that going to take? Well, thank you very much for having us and for um, recognizing five years of Quebec in existence and, and trying to work on bureaucratic bottlenecks in Nigeria. So this is an intervention that is very dear to the administration's heart. It's a legacy project right from 2016. In fact, before it was launched in 2016, uh, this was one of the first things that we did uh, groundwork for, and then the council was launched in July 2016. Now, we all know that when it comes to transformation initiatives and change, even with the private sector, it's an ongoing process that takes time. And one thing about human beings across the board is that it's quite difficult to change, especially behavioral change. So what we did was to put a process in place, a systemic intervention, rather than just uh, tackling things arbitrarily for the first time, you have an intervention that was actually placed into the economic recovery and growth plan. It had started in 2016 and then was inserted into the ERGP, its own intervention. I think that was the first time that Nigeria has put an ease of doing business intervention into one of our national plans. Now, working with about 13 honorable ministers, working with the secretary to the government, the head of service, the central bank governor, all the players that should be in the room, finance, um, transportation, all sort of the line ministries that deal with MSMEs in Nigeria, looking at a systemic way of working through their bureaucratic bottlenecks. I think that has been one of the most significant um, the, the limiting features of this, of this particular intervention. The collaboration has been extensive, then extending to the National Assembly, judi the judiciary, state governments, local governments. So it's been all hands on deck with the private sector and of course some support from the broader society at large. Well, it's also in in instructive to note that um, uh, the activities of PEBEC, uh, especially concerning ease of doing business, uh, has, uh, has, to use, has had to use some instruments, such as the National Action Plan, the fifth one yeah. has been launched, we understand. So can you bring, up to us, up, bring us up to speed on that? What is, what is that supposed to achieve in the first place? And how far so far with it? So rather than just speak to uh, ministries, departments, and agencies, or indeed colleagues at the subnational level, rather than just speaking to the problem, we collectively brainstorm. It's like a funnel process. We take feedback from private sector and we look at global best practices and we engage in a kind of uh, negotiation with uh, ministries, departments and agencies. We prioritize where the shoe is pinching the most for MSMEs and we work on, for instance, really granular. If a process uh, sort of takes, so for instance, the amount of documentation required for imports used to be 14 and for exports used to be 10. After brainstorming and, and looking at the process, we reduce that to eight and seven respectively. So it's that kind of hand-holding. Then the national action plans are 60-day accelerators that we've used to set concise targets. So for 60 days, we've already agreed the particular reforms that are going to be implemented, at least what the targets are. Of course, stretching ministries, departments, and agencies, and getting them to commit to trying to implement and with the political will and all that. And then you're tracking it because really we're firm believers in empirical data and we're firm believers in what gets measured gets done. So we've had six so far and we're going to have the seventh in Q1 of 2022. So every first quarter we have a 60 day uh, national action plan. This has been a system that has worked because it's traceable, it's identifiable, it's publicly announced. And it's something that Nigeria has been internationally recognized for, this homegrown system of using 60-day accelerators to push 
our reform agenda with specificity each year. How that percolates to the real uh, sector, if I can use that term, especially your primary uh, target audience, which are macro, small and medium enterprises, that's another you know, conversation altogether, given that as far as some economists are concerned, the lifespan, the average lifespan of a micro, small and medium enterprise, especially the small ones in Nigeria, the startups, it's just about five years or less. And uh, one of the reasons that has been adduced for that is uh, against this you know, bureaucracy, bureaucratic bottlenecks and multiple taxes from time to time. Uh, how significant is this, uh, or perhaps the issue of contending with it, uh, for PEBEC? So this is precisely why PEBEC is a systemic intervention Hello, can you still hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so this is exactly why PEBEC is a systemic intervention. So we actually, rather than trying to take on everything at the same time, we take specific reforms based on our engagement with the private sector. And so if private sector say, for instance, it is taxation that is really the bane of their contention, at the federal level, the payment of taxation was automated we worked with FIRS. The first time it was done, private sector weren't using the portal. And we had to go back on a road show around the country and ask uh, accountants, why aren't you using the sec? And they said it was even more tedious than the manual process. And FIRS had to go back to the drawing board to simplify the process. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, based on collaboration, based on communication, and we continue making things progressively easier. So when you look at, for instance, what we've been able to, to trace in the last five years, you see that where we started from, if it's with paying taxes, from manual processes in some, in some parts of the country, you didn't even have a tax office near you, you had to travel. Now you can do all these things virtually. And then it's now a matter of upgrading the system and making sure because the demand then started increasing for online electronic payments. So same thing with starting a business for company registration. It used to be six manual forms when we started this in 2026. Then that was collapsed into one form, CAC 1.1, and it was put online. So you can do your business registration in a matter of hours and you can register your business in two days. Of course, then you have because of the volume, you had some portal issues. So not to paint an overly rosy picture, but it's something that's continuous and it's in progress. And every time there's another challenge, what I will say to private sector is they very quickly forget where we're coming from and rightly so, they should demand even more and more. And we keep stretching the MDAs, stretching the targets. And that's why it's one of continuous reform to make it continuously, progressively easier to do business in Nigeria. Well, when you mentioned 2026, some will be wondering, is that five years to come or five years ago? I <laughs> assume you made 2016. But that, that's understandable. But you know... Um, that, that's what we are. We don't rest on our hours. We're always pushing forward. It's one uh, of continuous improvement. Well, nice way to put that. You know, one of the things that continues to give a number of people concern, okay, maybe, maybe I should put it this way, ma'am. Um, this this PEBEC, for instance, is a federal uh, intervention, just as you have said. And then you, you talked about uh, collaboration with subnationals, the states, and all of that. One wonders how that really percolates to the small business people who have to get their jobs done, you know, get on the roads and all of those things. So in terms of getting the message from the federal government through the state governments to the locals, the people who do the small businesses, What's the route and how challenging can that be? How, how, do we, how do people navigate to get access to some of the benefits of getting business done through the activities of PEBEC? That's an important question. Thank you for asking that. So after about a year, we realized pretty quickly by 2017 that every business is domiciled in a state or FCT. So it's just one economy. Businesses don't really, especially MSMEs, they don't really, um, sometimes between whether it's a federal obligation or a state one or a local government, it just kind of 
um, it's all mixed up to them. It's just government and it's just uh, bureaucracy and pain. So for instance, when you talk about multiple taxation, you would know that under the constitution, there are federal uh, taxes, there are state taxes and levies, there are local government levies, charges. And so when you have different arms of government or different levels of government coming at an MSME, for different things, and it's not just MSM, it's larger corporates. If you take sectors like um, uh, telecoms, for instance, they're they are taxed at all, all levels. So we, we decided to collaborate with state governments and replicate the PEBEC model across every state. So that collaboration was institutionalized through the National Economic Council, also chaired by the vice president. And unanimously, all the state governments are working on this. So every state government has a state reform champion. Every state government has a state ease of doing business council chaired by either the governor, the deputy governor, sometimes the head of service, sometimes the chief economic advisor. Depends on the state, but usually a very high level. And a team like the federal structure that works across board because business climate is very uh, cross-cutting and you need a lot of collaboration with colleagues. We've also worked very closely with the National Assembly. You'll know, of course, uh, the CAMA was a, was a very huge one. After the 30-year hiatus, it was repealed and reenacted. We worked closely with Ministry of Finance on the finance bill to put in ease of doing business inputs into that on a yearly basis. We've worked on uh, with the central bank for the collateral registry, uh, making sure that movable property can now be collateral. We most recently started working with AMAC because we had a whole lot of complaints about the FCT, doing business in the FCT. So we started working with AMAC because um, their federal, their constitutional rights for all these levels and arms of government, it has to be by collaboration. It has to be by partnership which is why the, the council has a broad representation, including private sector. That's just the only way because everybody realizes it's one economy. So we've been working quite well together, but it is a lot of work and we'll continue to do that. Starting a business is one thing. Sustaining the business, that's another kettle of fish altogether. And you've spoken to the, uh, to the taxation element of you know the the whole thing where businesses have to talk about revenue from time to time and things like that but once the business starts at what point do we say okay do, does pebec for instance say okay well our job is done with this business we can move to other things actually never down to insolvency so if you take for instance the world bank model although the report has been has been stopped now the World Bank model looked at the entire cycle, life cycle of a business, from starting a business to insolvency, because businesses do fail, and how can they then fail with dignity, and creditors are not cannibalizing that. So for instance, up to the extent of insolvency, we put a lot of uh, um, revolutionary provisions into the CAMA 2020 on insolvency practice in Nigeria, which was really well received by the legal community and RIPAN insolvency practitioners. So throughout the life cycle of a business, and we also work on different sector specific um, catalysts to really help when we're trying to push things like uh, digitization, we're trying to push a lot of the sectors that affect our young entrepreneurs, we focused on um, agribusiness, light manufacturing, um, transport and logistics. We look at the pain points there, agro-business, agro-exports. We look at how it is to do business within a, the country, movement of goods, all the checkpoints. We look at um, how to do business across borders with AFCFTA coming up now. We look at the challenges with, of course, we've talked about paying taxes, starting a business, dealing with construction permits, registering property, getting electricity, what kind of um, procedures are around there. I mean, things like even minority protection, just formalizing businesses because we want to see them be able to grow. We don't want them to stay at the micro stage. We don't even want them to stay at the small stage. We want them to be able to grow and dominate Africa by scaling. How that will be done uh, would be a question, madam. Because yeah, take the comment... It well, will be it will be one reform at a time. But yeah, so but we engage yeah, my, my apologies. 
I, I just yeah. wanted to put this question in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one a, a good number of these people, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, say uh, they are constrained about the fact that people seem to prefer uh, imported goods, or rather, the imported goods seem to be cheaper than the ones that are made in Nigeria, and that's a little troubling. But especially coming against the background of uh, the comments ascribed to the president of the AFDB, uh, Professor Akiomi Adishino, who says uh, it cost $35,000 to export 100 tons of produce from Nigeria compared to just $4,000 in Ghana. And that speaks volumes about maybe processes or even infrastructure that facilitates some of those things. Uh, is this something of concern to you and what's been done about very it? Very much so, very much so, very much so. So these are things, there are a number of issues. There's of course infrastructure issues that the government has been working on, but you have process issues and you have people issues also. So we can't run away from the corruption issues, we can't run away from the inefficiencies, we can't run away from ex extortions and, and um, people taking advantage of each other, even private sector on private sector, government on private sector. We have liabilities on both ends, uh, bribe givers, bribe takers. We need everybody to support the reforms and to work with the process. Yes, it's slower to do things the right way, but we have to make sure that we plug all those loopholes. We've been layering digitization, we've been clamoring for things like our single window reforms, our e-customs to be put in place. We've been clamoring for the, the road repairs that are being done. These are things that intermodal transportation into the ports. Of course, the Papa port has far outweighed its capacity. These are problems that are well known and that the PEBEC has been prioritizing and working on and urging everybody to join us in supporting this. I mean, on, at the fifth, and that was exactly what we depicted in the musical production, telling the journey of the last five years. Yes, it hasn't been an easy one. And yes, trying to um, fix some things in terms of processes, trying to fix some things in terms of behavioral change on all sides, and trying to fix some things in terms of discipline and productivity are taking some time, but the only way to fix things is to continue because we really just have to compete. So the reforms are ongoing. I could go into a lot of details. We have an empirical impact assessment report for the last five years. It details exactly what has been done and quite a lot has been done. If you've been following the Pebex story, you would know. But having said that, there's still so much more to do. As we get into 2022, we really have to ramp up the pace and we really just are demanding a lot more of the public and civil servants, the MDAs that we work with, 55 of them are tracked by PEBEC. The executive order 001, the first executive order of this administration, speaks to transparency and efficiency in public service delivery. We have our report, gov.ng. We measure these things empirically com compliance reports. We're big on consequence management. These are where we do need support and we need um, private sector to continue telling us where the shoe is pinching and we continue focusing specifically on those areas. Well, I was privileged to watch the musical which uh, was put up at PEBEC at five. May I say congratulations once again on the work uh, PEBEC is doing so far. However, um, there's still plenty of questions. I mean, as you talked about the musical, uh, which depicted from what you explained, real life situations uh, that small businesses or businesses in general have faced and how PEBEC has been able to intervene. Uh, what struck me was the fact that, you know, it would seem that in that musical, PEBEC just came out from nowhere and intervened in the matter. But oftentimes what we know must happen is that there must be a reporting mechanism. Uh, we've been told about a few reporting mechanisms that are available in many uh, government to people interface or government to business interface. But oftentimes people lack very little trust in these uh, reporting mm -hmm. mechanism. So how do you, how do you, uh, will I say, expand or re reinstate the confidence of the people to know that these mechanisms really do work? And wherever it is they encounter difficulties uh, that PEBEC or the relevant government agencies that should intervene in that scenario is willing and able to intervene. 
Thank you very much for that question, Mark. But the trust deficit has really been, I'll say, the biggest challenge since 2016. We continue to speak with integrity, continue to speak with determination and consistency. Please try us out, try the reforms. I mean, that's why I'm here this morning. We have the report gov, and we do get testimonials. It may not be all the time where we're successful, but we have quite a good success rate and we're very, very tenacious. Um, there are also uh, public servants in the MDAs. Every MDA has a report gov team, has a report reform champion. For instance, there, there are people that have put in, there was somebody that recently put in a complaint. He had applied for his passport through the regular process since August and he hadn't received it. And he put in that report of complaint and we got the testimonial yesterday that he's now received his passport. There are people that put in complaints. Some people don't want, because it's not a whistleblower app, you have to put in your name and your details because it's also not for witch hunting. We want to be able to investigate and check the facts. But we have hardworking public and civil servants who are ready and committed to making the system work, to making the reforms work. And they actually go after these challenges in their various offices and seek to, to solve them. So they're actually there to help Nigerians. Uh, so please try it out. Try it again and again and again. Tell your friends, report.gov.ng, it's an app. You can download it, Google Play, uh, Apple Store. And it's also a website, a portal. Well, I know I have seen you a few times. I mean, the last one we saw uh, was at the airport where there were serious complaints mm. about what was going on at the nation's international airports. Quite an embarrassment. Uh, and I do know that you were sitting right beside fan officials addressing uh, some of the misdemeanors which had been reported and the consequences which was going to be meted out. I do not know how are you being perceived now. This is on the, well, I say light turn of when, when they hear from <laughs> Pebeck or that uh, the secretary of Pebeck will be paying a visit. What usually happens these days? Well, you know, sometimes it's met with excitement. Sometimes it's met with we're getting attention. We have these challenges and I listen to their challenges. Sometimes it's met with defensiveness. You're taking over sort of, this is our mandate. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And I explained to them that, you know what? Every agency's mandate is to represent the Nigerian government, the sovereignty of the nation to protect it and in the best possible light. So it's one of collaboration because of course, public reforms speak to collaboration. So sometimes we're looking for single interface. We're asking agencies to sheath their swords and put down turf wars and territoriality and to work together. Maybe by executive order, maybe by regulation, sometimes by legislation. Um, you have the National Assembly also asking FAN and other agencies to come and, and speak to some of these embarrassing issues. I also was invited, I was there with the National Assembly, um, speaking with the, the Honorable Speaker, invited me because we've had different conversations about, you know, when these things um, go viral, the dirty water splashes on everyone. It's not even a federal government matter. It's not a government, you know, all arms of government matter. It's a Nigerian matter. The dirty water splashes on all of us. So that's what we, we, we speak truth to each other, that this is something that concerns each of us. And as Nigerians first, we just have to solve it and make it better. Uh, I, I, we've talked largely about uh, the multiple taxation ambit of things. Uh, I don't know if you want to quickly, in 30 seconds, respond to this question by uh, Nene, who says one of the challenges businesses face in Nigeria is particularly that of multiple taxation. And here's the catch. Taxes are directly targeted at ordinary Nigerians. This speaks to the trust deficit. We want to quickly address this in 30 seconds. Yeah, we had to do a cost of compliance pilot survey with Lagos and FCT because when private sector are talking, they're talking beyond official tax rates. They're talking about the, the, legislate, the, the regulatory um, charges, the bottlenecks. So they're finding it difficult to have a business plan. It's like you're swimming down a swimming pool and halfway you're stuck because what you had budgeted for your business in the first year or second year, agencies are coming out of nowhere and everywhere. 
depending on the sector. So those are the things that we're working on really. We have a regulatory reform intervention, working with MDAs to make them understand that everybody's 40,000 is combining to make an unsustainable demand on these MSMEs. So it's not about, oh, we only charge them 40,000 for a license a year. It's about if 10 of you are charging them 40,000, it's 400,000. So it still boils down to communication and collaboration. And that's why from the presidential level, we have to take this forward. We have to thank you very much for all that you've been doing, particularly for being on this program this morning. Dr. Jimoke Oduwale is secretary to the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council and special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. Thank you and well done. Thank you.